Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. Question number one has been withdrawn. I call question number two, Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many GP surgeries are not currently accepting new patients. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Deputy Officer, the Scottish Government does not hold this information, but I am clear that patients should always have access to general medical services. Practices must apply to their health board to close the list and agree the conditions and timeline for reopening them. Circumstances will arise where a practice experiences capacity issues and is unable to routinely accept new patients onto its list. We expect health boards to work with practices as constructively and as flexibly as is appropriate to help manage the situation and ensure that all patients have access to GP services. Martin Whitfield. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but there can be no denying that under this SNP government, GP surgeries and our GPs are particularly overworked and overstretched. Statistics published this week show in the last 10 years the whole time equivalent number of GPs has plummeted by 200, but registered patients in Scotland soared by over 390,000 in the same period. So if the Scottish Government was a patient, would they accept this from their GPs? Come, Secretary. Well, President Officer, I do recognise that uh, general practice services are under pressure. In some parts of the country, they are under greater pressure than others because of population shifts, which create particular challenges for practices. But the member will also be aware of the very significant investment we put in to expand the primary care team, with some 4,700 additional staff being recruited to support our general practice practices across the country through physiotherapists, phlebotomists, pharmacy services, all of which help to support uh, general practice. Alongside that, the commitment we made to recruit an extra 800 GPs over the course of this parliamentary term and into the next parliamentary term, which we're making good progress on. But I do recognise and acknowledge the challenges that general practice have, which is why we've been expanding the primary care team around them in order to make sure patients can receive a broad range of services within general practice. Thank you. GPs want to keep their lists open, but to do that, they risk becoming overwhelmed and can't offer the same level of service. And one particular issue arises with the construction of new build developments, as the Cabinet Secretary uh, referred to himself. Planning permission is often conditional upon developers improving things like local infrastructure, roads, rails, cycle paths, investing in schools to cope with increases in that population of that area. But no provision is made for increasing primary care capacity and GP surgeries become inundated with new patients when already full to capacity. So will the Scottish Government look at addressing this issue? Cabinet Secretary. I'm saying, officer, I recognise this has been a long-standing issue. It's an issue which has even been experienced in my own constituency with the new housing developments and the pressure that can then place on local health infrastructure and in particular primary care uh, services. I'm very open to looking at where there is more we can do in order to ensure that the potential impact that residential developments have on local health infrastructure is an issue that could be addressed more effectively uh, through the way in which planning arrangements operate within local authorities. And I'm more than happy to engage with the member on that issue to see whether there's further action that could be taken. And supplementary, Willie Ray. The Cabinet Secretary seems very laid back about this. He's clearly not read the words of Dr Andrew Buist from the BMA, who says that demand is outstripping capacity, GPs are working beyond safe limits, they're exhausted and they're burnt out, but the Cabinet Secretary acts as if it's not an emergency. So what new steps is he going to take to deal with this emergency before patients suffer? Secretary. Officer, um, I'm very acutely aware of the challenges here and the need for action to be taken on the matter. In fact, uh, Andrew Buse is someone who I've met with, I think, three times within the last two weeks alone, where we've discussed these very uh, issues. So I'm acutely aware of the pressures which are on general practice. I've outlined measures which we're taking in terms of increasing recruitment. Actually, the level of specialist training provision for general practice is increasing as well. So we've got more uh, coming into general practice as well this year. Alone, we were, I believe we were oversubscribed in those who wanted to go into a general practice as a speciality. So we're continuing to look at how we can increase numbers in the years ahead. So we want more GPs. And of course, we have more GPs in Scotland per head of population than any other part of the UK. But equally, the recruitment of that wider primary care team, some 4,731 additional staff have been provided. That's physiotherapists, phlebotonists, uh, pharmacy staff, 
all of whom are critical in meeting that wider demand that patients have got, so that it takes some of the demand away directly from general practice and allowing others to get the support they require, whether it be through a physiotherapist or whether it be through... Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I will now move area. to question three. Polly McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the current options available to record the relationship status of a deceased person are sufficient for the purpose of this information being accurately represented on a death certificate. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding officer, the information recorded in an entry in the Register of Deaths is intended to form an accurate and permanent legal record. The high quality records produced by registrars form important sources of historical information and allow those researching their family past to make clear and accurate links to their ancestors. The information required is set out in a Scottish statutory instrument made by the Registrar General and approved by the Scottish Ministers and the required relationship information is marital or civil partnership status. Polly McNeill. I apologise to the Cabinet Secretary for the complexity of this supplementary, but if you bear with me. Uh, only the wife, husband or relative of a recently deceased person has the legal right to register their death. And for partners who are cohabitants, regardless of how many years they don't have this right, they must either own property of which their loved one has died or be present at their death. But cohabiting partners are also not allowed to be recognised in the death certificate. But apparently some registry offices can record the deceased as being survived by the former partner who they divorced many years ago. And this is the key point. So does the Scottish Government consider this to be right in such cases or in fact accurate if they have been long divorced? And could this happen where there has been an abusive spouse? I just raised this question. If the deceased status was of divorce, has a surviving partner, perhaps there's no need to record the former relationship. So I wonder if the Scottish um, Government can raise awareness Ms. amongst Ms. We need to get to the partners question to the Cabinet Secretary, please. and that registrars should be sensitive to these cases. Cabinet Secretary, I hope you managed to get it. Uh, President Officer, this is indeed a somewhat uh, complex matter. It's a matter that the Scottish Government has given some consideration to because we've had uh, a number of uh, correspondences on this matter, uh, and essentially because we recognise that many couples today live together in uh, enduring relationships, and indeed uh, this is becoming more confident. However, uh, but if we had to allow cohabitee or cohabitant to be included in the entry of the death register, there are some uh, you know, complications around us. I'm happy to write to Ms McNeill um, in detail, uh, but one and just one example of compl com com complication uh, would be that if the registrar uh, may be faced with a situation where the deceased remained legally married or in a civil partnership but was also cohabiting at the time of death, it would not be clear whether the person should be recorded as cohabiting um, or married. In terms of the issue around different practice, that would not Ca be Cabinet my Secretary, understanding, you're over your time. You'll need to but a follow-up and correspondence. Um, I call question number four, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its cladding remediation programme. Cabinet Secretary, you surely answer of it. The safety of homeowners and residents is our absolute priority. That is why we introduced the Housing Cladding Remediation Scotland Bill on the 1st of November that will give ministers new powers to ensure the remediation of buildings with unsafe cladding. And it is why we are seeking the transfer of powers in order to create a building safety levy. We are undertaking a robust programme of pilot single building assessments. These assessments are being completed and remediation work is underway. Willie Coffey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. At our recent local government committee, we heard that of the 105 buildings in the pilot programme, only 27 of those have had assessments commissioned, and only one building has had remediation work, and only one building has had mitigation measures. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to explain this progress and to give an assurance that this work will proceed at a much faster pace? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> So when the Minister for Housing gave evidence to committee in May, he did acknowledge that for many homeowners this process has taken too long. The tenure system in Scotland is of course different to the system in England and that complexity is an additional challenge for the programme given that we do not have single building owners. Last year, the then Cabinet Secretary announced a change in approach to the programme, moving from a grant model to a direct procurement model, which has led to a real increase in the pace of the programme. And I hope that gives Mr Coffey some reassurance on this issue. Supplementary, Ben McPherson. I understand from meetings with the Minister and the Roundtable that CoCab Stewart uh, held yesterday 
how challenging this issue is for the government, but I also know from my constituents and others that can, people who have affected buildings really appreciate communication from the government. So therefore, can the Cabinet Secretary advise whether the Scottish Government will consider proactive communications on a regular basis with affected building owners to increase awareness of the process of remediation and timescales for this? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Mr McPherson for his question. The Minister for Housing has had uh, conversations with a number of members as well, importantly, as residents directly in recent weeks and indeed months since taking up his post. And he is very keen to ensure that we improve communication to the homeowners of the buildings within the programme. So further to this, I understand he has asked officials to scope several options, including regular communications on the overall programme flight path, as well as building specific communications and I would expect this to be implemented in the new year and I'm sure the Minister will keep Mr McPherson updated on progress. And supplementary, Miles Briggs. Deputy President Officer, as has been stated in Scotland, only one such uh, programme uh, of works has been progressed. There's a huge amount of detail not on the face of the cladding bill with regards to the single building assessment, cladding, assurance register and the responsible developer scheme. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does she not acknowledge that the continued absence of this detail in the bill creates risks for those affected, both residents and home builders, and has the potential to prolong uncertainty to residents impacted? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm sure uh, the Minister would be uh, more than happy to go into the, the details of this with uh, the, the member, but can I give but one example um, of uh, the reasons behind our approach? The approach uh, for responsible developers scheme aligns actually with the approach taken by the UK Government when establishing their responsible actors scheme. The UK Government also put the details of that scheme in secondary legislation. The level of detail required for the scheme is more suited to secondary legislation, but I'm sure that's a discussion which the committee uh, will have in evidence and which the Minister would be happy to respond to. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to ensure that rural populations have convenient and appropriate access to care homes. Minister Marie Todd. Although we have overall responsibility for health and social care policy in Scotland, the statutory responsibility for delivering, commissioning and charging for services lies with local authorities and health and social care partnerships. We have set clear standards for the quality of care provided in Scotland, which includes convenient and appropriate access to care homes. I and my officials regularly engage with local partners to assure ourselves that these standards are met nationally. We are also committed to building a national care service to improve the quality and consistency of social care across Scotland, recognising the different approach needed often for people living in rural communities. Brian Widow. I can thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, McClement House Care Home in Lanark is currently consulting on proposals to close the care home to fill a 20.8 million shortfall in their social care budget, compounded by circa, uh, circus 18 million government clawback from the Health and Social Care Partnership earlier this year. The next nearest council run facilities are located in the central belt towns of Hamilton, Rutherglen and East Kilbride. Can I ask the Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to prevent the closure of care homes in rural areas that provide vital services to the community, such as McClimate House Care Home in my constituency? Minister. So, as I said in, in my earlier answer, we set the standards for social care and we set the policy direction, but it is the local authorities who have responsibility for commissioning and delivering and charging for those services. Um, I am, uh, as I said, nationally, we are working towards a national care service, which I think will improve the situation both rurally and urban, um, but I have no locus to become involved in care home closures in local areas. Question number six, James Dornan, who is joining us remotely. Mr Dornan. Uh, it's vital that high quality of adult no, social uh, care... Mr Dornan, please stop. I had actually moved to question number six, which you have. Oh, so could we now apologies. move to question six, please? Thank you. I'd like to have a supplementary for question five. Yes, but I, I haven't apologize. taken it, Mr Dornan, so could you move uh, to your yes, own question number I, six? Thank I you very much. I am now going on to question six, Speaker. To ask the Scottish Government how the proposals outlined in its latest Building a New Scotland paper, Social Security and Independent Scotland, would support Scotland's social security system. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. 
Our latest Building a New Scotland paper sets out how, with independence, we could build on the progress we have already made in creating a fairer system with limited powers and demonstrates how an independent Scotland could go even further. This includes introducing early reforms to universal credit, scrapping the two-child limit and rape clause, scrapping the young parent penalty and stopping the rollout of changes to reserved ill health and disability benefits. In time, we could build a fairer system, such as a minimum income guarantee, ensuring everyone has an income to live a dignified life. James Dornan. Uh, the Building a New Scotland paper outlines how future governments in independent Scotland might implement and build in a minimum income guarantee in a way that cannot be fully achieved within the limits of devolution. Can the Cabinet Secretary elaborate on this proposal and the necessity of independence to achieve true financial security and well-being for Scottish households? Cabinet Secretary. Given the fact that both uh, the uh, Conservatives and Labour at UK level seem to still be refusing to make changes to our welfare system, then it is disappointing to see uh, that we will have to do what we can within the settlement that we have. We have made progress on this, but as the interim report from the MIG expert group showed, uh, there are limitations, perhaps, that what can be done about minimum income guarantee under devolution. Uh, the group is producing its final report next year, and I'm really looking forward to the recommendations on the next steps about, yes, what we can do under devolution, but uh, how importantly it may require the powers of independence to truly allow our citizens to have a dignified social security system. And supplementary, Paul O'Kane. Uh, not to state the obvious, presiding officer, but this paper is the latest iteration of what the SNP might do in a hypothetical future and does nothing to support Scotland's social security system right now. That's a social security system that has overspent massively on IT, waits for processing claims on adult disability payment and other benefits are through the roof, and has delayed the transfer of key benefits, leaving them in the hands of the DWP. So shouldn't this government be focused on running a properly functioning system now in Scotland rather than dealing in hypotheticals? Cabinet Secretary. So I will give one example of how we have used our powers already, presiding officer, and that is, of course, through the Scottish Child Payment. And the reason we're doing that is because of the inadequate level of universal credit. So what a shame that whether it's the Tories or whether it's Labour, we will have to continue to mitigate against the worst excesses of any UK government because of the absolute refusal of either of the parties to actually take seriously the impact that welfare reform has had on their citizens. And isn't it a shame Mr O'Kane's party seems quite happy to back the Tories in actually keeping people in poverty rather than lifting them out as we do through our own social security system? Question number seven, Douglas Lovson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce waiting times for ambulances in North East Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to work closely with the Scottish Ambulance Service and NHS Grampian to improve hospital handover times for ambulance crews in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and Dr Gray's Hospital in Elgin, which is having a significant impact on response times. NHS Grampian have identified that they require additional acute capacity to meet demand and are in the process of opening 40 new acute beds to ease capacity pressures. 18 of these are currently operational and a further 14 are expected to open by mid-January. It is anticipated that this will improve patient flow through ARI and reduce ambulance stacking. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, President officer, it seems that long wait times for ambulances is being caused by ambulances queued up at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary for mm -hmm. hours on end. Earlier this year, my father had a six-hour wait in the back of an ambulance in severe pain, but these waits now seem to be commonplace. The ambulance drivers and paramedics are doing a brilliant job, but are being failed by this devolved government. So will the Cabinet Secretary work with NHS Grampian to improve the situation and stop these excessive waits. Cabinet well, Secretary. Officer, I'm uh, sorry to hear about the difficulty that his father had with his uh, own weight uh, in an ambulance. And of course, it's important we take action to address these measures. Uh, the biggest challenge we have in terms of flow through our A&E departments is delayed discharges within our hospitals, uh, which prevent patients moving from A&E into the hospital setting. Uh, which is why we're taking concerted action with our health and social care partnership to try and address these issues 
There have been issues in Aberdeenshire in particular over recent months which we are trying to address with them to see further action. I can also assure the member that additional support services have been provided to Aberdeenshire. For, so, for example, the Scottish Ambulance Service have put in place additional ambulance resource in Grampian with two new double crewed ambulances in Aberdeen alone, one new night shift ambulance based at Aberdeen Central <coughs> Fire Station, a fully funded paramedic response unit in Elgin, and a new back shift in Elgin uh, and a new back shift in Banff. And at Keith and Huntley, ambulance stations are now both operating on a 24-7 basis. But we need to address the issue of delayed discharges within the hospital to allow flow into it, and that's an issue we're continuing to focus on with the Health and Social <coughs> Care Partnerships.